morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of EA Festival. And um, I'm very excited to introduce the first event, which is a panel discussing psychedelic drugs with three top experts, global experts, and certainly the top experts in the UK, among the top experts, who are Joanna Neal, who is a professor of psychopharmacology at the, Univ at the University of Manchester, and she currently chairs the Ma Medical Psycho Psychedelics Working Group for Drug Science the UK's leading organization of academics, policy, policymakers, and industry representatives conducting research about psychedelic drugs and seeking to change attitudes and policies about them so they can be used for medical therapy. She is accompanied by Lauren McDonald, who is a doctor for the Center for Psychedelic Research at Imperial College, as well as the co-founder of Essence, Essence Medicine, a nonprofit providing psycho-spiritual support for patients with terminal illness. Last, we have Keith Abraham, who is the CEO of Heroic Hearts UK, an organization which helps military veterans access alternative forms of psychological therapy, especially when conventional treatments have failed. So because we have a packed schedule, I also want to explain the format for today's event, which is going to be a 15-minute Q&A with Joanna. And then Lauren is going to tell her story of first-hand experience with psychedelic drug therapy, a life-changing experience, followed by Keith, who has a, a different story to tell, but equally dramatic and fascinating. So to begin, so uh, Joanna, so first, tell us what a psychedelic is, because okay. I, I want to treat this session as also kind of a okay. little bit, as much as we can, in a, a very short span of time, Psychedelic Drugs 101. Okay. I just want to explain what the Medical Psychedelics Working Group is. Sorry, Joanne. No, no, please. Um, before we start. So this is part of, we have three working groups at Drug Science, and Drug Science is an independent organization providing evidence-based information about drugs. Legal drugs and illegal drugs, and there's nobody else doing that. So I highly recommend you go to the website, drugscience.org.uk. There are podcasts on psychedelics, you know, with the people who were there in the 60s and the 70s, and then the, the kind of new generation of people working on this are absolutely extraordinary. So I highly recommend you, you do that. We have three aims, and one is education. So this is, this is a paradigm shift in how we treat mental illness. Um, so it's, it's really important that people really have a good understanding of exactly what this is. Um, Destigmatization. So psychedelics are extremely badly stigmatized. Of all the illegal drugs, they hold the most stigma. And that's been since they were made illegal, UN Convention 1971, Nixon started the war on drugs, which has been an abject failure, cost more lives. Prohibition does not work. We know that. So what I'm trying to do is reform these drug laws, but specifically to enable people to research psychedelics. And that's part of my work with Manchester, because we have a policy unit, and part of the work with the Psychedelics Working Group. But our ultimate aim is to enable patients to access these medicines safely, on the NHS. And this is for serious mental illness where nothing else works. So we're talking about addictions, um, severe depression, and a lot of these illnesses are coming from trauma. So the existential anxiety that occurs with getting a, um, a terminal diagnosis. Um, and so, so that's the point, really. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and we're going to learn an awful lot more about that from, you know, from the, the experts here. Okay, so what, that's great. What is a psychedelic? So psychedelic itself means mind manifesting. And what we're talking about here is plant medicines. So psilocybin, and that's what you're going to read most about in the press at the moment, because the clinical trials going on currently are all focused around psilocybin. And that is the active ingredients of magic mushrooms. And you can extract that from the mushroom, you can take the mushroom, and you can synthesize that in the laboratory. So it lends itself very well to clinical trials. And it's very similar to LSD. LSD is a psychedelic. And that was discovered by, you probably all know this story, by Albert Hoffman in 1938. 
He was working for Sandals, one of the big pharmaceutical companies. He took it himself, and Hoffman lived to be 102. Um, and Sandals realized that LSD had some very special properties. And of course, we all, we all know this now. And Sandals distributed LSD to people like me, to scientists, um, to psychiatrists, to psychologists, um, to people who wanted to learn more about this and use it in their clinical practice. And that's how they discovered the enormous therapeutic benefit of LSD. So it showed enormous benefits for pain, um, for the illnesses we've been talking about, for addictions. And Humphrey Osmond treated 2,000 people with alcohol use disorder with LSD in the 1950s. Um, and he got a 45% abstinence rate. Alcoholics Anonymous gets 8%. We, don't, we can't do that now with any of our modern medicines. Joe, can I ask you a question? Sorry, yes. I'm going to ask you a question, Joe. <laughs> okay, because the, ex the words mind manifesting, that expression, yes. is largely subjective. So yeah. would you say that that class of psychedelics, they're a group which has a, affects the same receptors of the brain, Don't, without getting into detail. We won't go into receptors, but, but, that's but not fair. But I think that also, but I think it's important to, to say yeah. the LSD, psilocybin, DMT, are they all affecting yes. the same so, receptors? Yes, so they are all what we call tryptamines, and they're very closely related to 5-hydroxytryptamine, serotonin, that we've all heard of. That's a neurotransmitter that exists in the brain and controls mood and appetite and, you know, many, many um, brain functions. But the other thing about 5-HT is the body is awash with 5-HT, so it's found in platelets and it's found in the GI tract as well. So it has many effects. And it's one of many neurotransmitters in the brain. And they all... So in the cortex of the brain there are a lot of receptors for serotonin. And what the tryptamines do, so DMT, and DMT is the active ingredient of ayahuasca, and Keith will be telling you about that's the, the, the South American brew um, that is extracted from the, the vine, but Keith will be telling us more about that. So DMT, LSD, and psilocybin, they're all similar. They're tryptamines, they're like serotonin, and they interact with this receptor in the brain that's located in the cortex and that that's really how they produce the remarkable effects that they have and what I want to tell you really about psychedelic treatment that we're working on now so so just to go back to LSD maybe I should put this yeah, in context yeah. <clears throat> so there were a thousand research publications on the beneficial effects of LSD thanks to Hoffman thanks to um, Sandoz. And people were starting to realize that these can have enormous benefits for people like connecting to nature and because, because what these drugs do is dissolve the ego and kind of give you a different perspective <coughs> on, your, on your life and your relationship with the world. Ego dissolution. Um, Nixon was fighting a war in Vietnam. The CIA, Nixon, they didn't want people to have this kind of perspective, very anti-war. Um, and connected to other people, so they shut it all down. And they knew about the benefits, but they shut it down, and psychedelics became class A drug and schedule one drug. And you know what a class A drug is. They have the stiffest penalties for supply and use. Um, and that was in 1971. Um, and a schedule one drug is something that we cannot research as academics and scientists without special permissions from the Home Office. But those are opioids, just so that <coughs> I think it's important to sorry, just say they're so being treated the same. <coughs> well, the legal sorry. treatment is the same. Well, no, not, well, not quite, because opioids are in Schedule 2 of the, oh. of the convention. Sorry, Joanne. Um, and that means we can, as researchers, as <coughs> clinicians, we have an exemption, and we are allowed to research those freely. But if something is in Schedule 1, we can't. So we have to apply, especially to the Home Office, for a special license, and that's not really a concern. But that's why I'm trying to change the law. Because many people want to research psychedelics, and we know they've got enormous medicinal potential, um, but they can't because of okay. the drug laws. I, I, just want the, the, I mentioned that, even though that was factually incorrect, because I wanted to make the point that, and I think this is what you're getting at, mm. that drugs such as heroin and cocaine they're, that are, tend to be lumped together social, culturally, 
with psychedelics unfairly because one of the points that this panel is going to make is that they're not dangerous in the same way and therefore they shouldn't be given this treatment as pariahs basically within the scheduling system yeah or, i mean or the, not the same <clears throat> they shouldn't be treated as as, as no, if they were no, as, no, as a harmful drug so they definitely shouldn't be class a drugs um, and in fact all the research research shows that they are physiologically very safe drugs that's not to say that they don't produce a very um intense psychological experience as you'll hear from from the experts and that's not to be ignored so you know but in a in a clinical context or in a retreat setting um, they are remarkably safe and we've been doing some research at drug science looking for the harms in the publications and there are many publications and actually uh, Rucker down at King's has done a study looking for harms in healthy volunteers and he's, you know, you get an increase in blood pressure and an increase in heart rate. It's very transient. Um, and I, he, he didn't find any evidence for harms in a relatively large sample of people. One thing I would say, we talked yesterday about diversity. This is a very white industry so far. This is very big business at the moment. You'll probably read about this. There are 50 companies listed on the stock exchange that are developing psychedelic medicines. Um, and of course, these medicines belong to indigenous people. They've been using ayahuasca, psilocybin, psilocybin grows all around us, um, sorry, the mushrooms, for thousands of years. So, so that's going to be patenting something that's a plant medicine is going to be a little bit difficult. But that's, I digress. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, no, you answered because <clears throat> our first three questions were what is a psychedelic? Yeah. Why is this important? And I also wanted to mention uh, an important fact, which I discovered on the Psychedelics podcast, oh. which is another fantastic mm. podcast about the history, uh, not uh, mainly of psychedelic drugs and why they ended up being, um, uh, how would you say, ended up with this terrible reputation, but how we need to actually take active measures to counteract this image that they have. But importantly, 20% of European adults are on antidepressants and 13% in the United States and 11% in the UK. So this is why it's important to know more about psychedelic drugs because if they are much more effective than conventional medical therapies, it's something that you know it, it, it pays for all of us to learn more about them. Absolutely, yeah. That's a, and we have a mental health crisis at the moment. So many people are on antidepressants. And for at least a third of people, they do not work at all. For a third of people, they will have some benefit. It tends to be short term and only a third of people will actually go into remission. Um, and the other thing about taking, you're taking a drug every day. So whatever that is, it's going to have a side effect burden. And antidepressants have quite a large side effect burden. So sexual dysfunction, nausea, um, headaches, there are quite a number of, of side effects. So you've, you have your depression, that may be resolving with the drug, but you have this side effect burden. The, and why I said psychedelics are a complete paradigm shift in psychiatry, something we've never done before, not since the 50s and 60s. The clinical model is one high dose or two with extensive psychotherapy. I mean, we talk about set and setting, and Lauren, as a psychiatrist, will elaborate on this a little bit. But you need to be in the right frame of mind, so you need to be in the right mindset and you need to be absolutely in the right setting, so retreat setting, a clinical setting. But that can be it for some people. So you're taking this, this, and it's a relatively high dose, and it is a very intense experience, and I would highly recommend you watch the magic medicine film that's on YouTube, which is one of the imperial trials, and you'll see the experiences of three guys with severe depression taking psilocybin and what happened to them beforehand and, and how they progress afterwards. But that's extraordinary. So you have no side effect burden. So you've had this treatment. You probably need a lot of therapy afterwards. Because this, people say this is the most profound experience of their lives. Um, and it's very difficult to just slot back into your normal daily routine. Um, so you, and, and for many people, it changes their, their perspective. It changes their career. Um, so that's something that, that really it's, it's important. And the other thing is that psychedelics heal people. 
and people talk about, about being healed. We don't do that in psychiatry. We give drugs, your therapy, we manage people's symptoms. And actually healing is not kind of a word. It's an aim, but it doesn't happen very much in psychiatry. Oh, that's a huge <clears throat> point. And on that note, now Lauren's going to tell her story, which I think is especially potent since she's a medical doctor and underwent also the transformative experiences due to psychedelic therapy. Mm. So Lauren, yeah. please go ahead and share Hello, your story. Can you us. hear me first of all? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Uh, so yeah, thank you for having us here. And as Joe said, um, my background, so up until the beginning of this year, I was working in the NHS as a psychiatry doctor. And since February, I've been with the Centre for Psychedelic Research at Imperial. And it's a really exciting role. I'm a study doctor and also one of the psychedelic guides. So I'm working across quite a few of the trials that Joe's already mentioned. Um, and it's an exciting time. We're really in this kind of psychedelic renaissance. And although kind of from a professional um, kind of level, I've kind of entered it because I could see in psychiatry, you know, there's a lot of conditions we're not really helping particularly well. Um, we really do need this paradigm shift in order to be able to help people um, better because our, our current system is just not working. And at the same time, I've also come into the psychedelic space from a very personal experience with my own healing journey with psychedelics. And this all came about because in 2014, I was diagnosed with cancer and by 2015, I had stage four cancer, and that means it spread. So I had it in my lung, my adrenal glands, um, my lymph nodes, uh, my chest wall. So the cancer was really spreading. And I had several surgeries, and every time the tumors were cut out, the cancer would come back. And at the end of 2015, I was told by my oncology team that there was no more treatment options for me. My cancer was really aggressive. It wasn't responding to any treatments they had available. And I was given a prognosis of around 12 months. And I was 31 years old at the time. And you're not expecting to kind of come face to face with your mortality at any age, really. I think we all live in a kind of death denial society, but definitely not at the age of 31. And I was really plunged into what I now understand to be existential distress, spiritual crisis, um, huge anxiety. I was waking up at four o'clock in the morning, just lying there. You know, if you've, if, if you've ever had those mornings when you wake up at four o'clock in the morning, that you know, the, the house is still dark, you feel really, really alone. And I would just ruminate on when am I going to die? When am I going to start getting really sick? Um, and then the bigger questions, things like, had my life had meaning? Had I loved enough? Had I let myself be loved enough? Was I going to be leaving a legacy? So just huge, huge questions that I'd never asked myself before. And I was incredibly fortunate after about four or five months of kind of just waiting, really, to see what was going to happen next. Um, I found out there was a new drug, immunotherapy, and I was el eligible to try it. And fast forward six months more, I was in remission, which is absolutely incredible because I had about a 25% chance of actually, you know, the drug actually working. So the fact that this drug had come along out of the blue and then I'd managed to get myself into this 25%, I mean, it was absolutely incredible. And at the same time, I was really left with all those huge questions, um, that kind of existential anxiety, and I was really, really scared of the cancer coming back. Um, and... At that time, I went down a YouTube rabbit hole one day and amazingly found myself um, listening to a YouTube channel about psychedelics. And a particular video I watched was um, by a professor from Johns Hopkins University. And he's called Roland Griffiths, and I really recommend you going to watch this video because he's a wonderful, wonderful speaker. And he was just explaining that they had just published a study looking at cancer patients with existential distress, anxiety, um, and that they'd given them psilocybin therapy and that these patients were reporting reduced anxiety, less fear, fear of death, less fear of recurrence for those who were in remission, and just a better quality of life. So I just thought, even though I was in remission, I thought I do need something here. I, you know, the, the Western medical model hadn't really supported my emotional health, my spiritual health during this health crisis. 
So knowing that I couldn't legally access psychedelic medicine in the UK, I took myself off to a retreat in the Netherlands. And like so many people, um, I, I truly had um, a life-changing experience there. Both personally, you know, I left the retreat no longer scared of dying, no longer scared of um, the cancer coming back, just with a new um, appreciation for life, for my family, for my friends, the fact that I'd potentially survived cancer. And not only had I had this personal experience, um, which was so powerful, um, and, I, and I, I could talk about my personal experience forever, but um, I'll, I'll, just for time, maybe we can come back to it. But um, yeah, it really kind of also changed the career, of the, the direction of my career as well, because obviously working in psychiatry um, with not many treatment options for other people, I just suddenly realized actually there's some, something out there that can be so healing and so profound, and it can happen, you know, in, in, a, in one experience. So rather than taking antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications, you can have this deep, deep healing. Um, that lasts. Lauren, I think you should spend mm. a couple minutes talking about what you actually experienced, because <laughs> to say it as a conclusory yeah. statement obviously doesn't have the same kind of impact yeah. on the audience. I think people who they would be very curious to learn about that. Okay, I will, give, a, I will give it a go. Describe a little bit. If you've bit. ever heard, if you've ever, <laughs> when people try and explain their psychedelic experience, it's it's kind of quite funny because um, it, it, they are quite difficult to explain. But I would say that. So, so just to kind of give it a bit of context, um, if any of you have ever taken psychedelics recreationally, um, this experience is very, very different. So um, at the retreat where I went to, um, we were given a really high dose. We were given eye shades, um, the music was playing, and we were really encouraged to go on an inward journey. So rather than you know, being outside in nature, enjoying the beautiful colors and you know, the, the, the vividness of the beauty, this was very much in, internal. And the music pay, plays a key role um, with these psychedelic journeys because they really hold you in this um, kind of container. And at the same time, they, they can take you to the absolute depths of your pain. And then they can bring you up to the music just kind of manages to then bring you up to kind of bliss as well. So it's a real, real roller coaster ride. And during the experience, I, it started off just with a lot of emotional release. So um, I've been quite stoical during my cancer experience, but it really, really cracked me open. And there was a lot of tears that came out and my actual whole body was shaking. Um, and I think that was just release of trauma, kind of stored trauma. It was just a way for it all to come out. And then, as Joe said, psychedelics have this way of if you take a big enough dose, and obviously you have to do it in such a careful way in the right set and setting, and yet as long as you feel safe to surrender and let go into the experience, you can really get blasted off into another realm. And that's exactly where I found myself about halfway through the trip. And the only way I can describe it is that I was no longer in my body, I was no longer me as I know it as flesh and bones, but I was just energy, um, kind of my spirit essence floating around in the cosmos, whizzing around. And I think the, the, there was so much in that experience that was healing, but the, the kind of real take home that I've carried with me was I got to... I say meet, but you know, when you're all in energy form, it's not really meeting as you know it. But I got to reconnect with a lot of the patients who had been on the chemotherapy unit with me and who had since died. And we got to kind of just have this beautiful kind of knowing that, yes, they are no longer here on this physical realm, but they are very, very much still around. They're, they're always here. Um, you know, our bodies die and yet our essence continues. And it was really beautiful. And I even had one of the um, ladies say to me, it's going to be okay. You know, even if the cancer comes back, whatever happens, it's going to be okay. You don't truly die. Your essence continues. So I think to have that, rather than just... Because I, I was a real atheist before. I didn't really have any spiritual practices or understandings. But there was a sudden sense of knowing that I needed to open up to the mystery of the not knowing. So, you know, I, who knows what happens when we die? Nobody knows. And rather than just assume that's it, that's fine, or that's the end, which I think was 
part of what used to terrify me at four o'clock in the morning when I was lying there on my own. It was just this, ah, oh, there might be something afterwards. And that in itself was really comforting. And the other um, kind of really beautiful experience I had was um, prior to my experience, another young patient had died, a lovely lady called Jessie. And while I was in my psychedelic experience, I had this sense that I was breathing really, really deeply and that Jessie had kind of come into my body and was inhabiting my body. And I was Jessie, Jessie was me. We were kind of one and the same. And I had this sense of when, I had this understanding that when I use my eyes to look out into the world, so to see a beautiful sunset, for example, that Jessie is with me, so therefore Jessie is looking out at this beautiful sunset. And I've actually come back, and a few times my partner and I have been watching a sunset, and I'll say, let's linger, let's stay a little bit longer, Jessie wants to see a little bit more. And there is that sense of like carrying people that we've loved and lost with us as a result of this psychedelic experience. So, I mean, I could talk about, there's so, there's so much, like I said, you know, you have these incredible insights and downloads, and they're really personal, so, you know, I'm sure everyone has a very unique experience, but you get what you need, I think, in a psychedelic experience. And for me, that knowing and that comfort that I've had, um, I'm no longer scared of dying. I'm no, I never think about the cancer coming back anymore. And I'm just leaning now more and more into the mystery and the not knowing. Um, and I've changed career as a result, so I'm now working for the psychedelic, uh, the, the research unit at Imperial. And I'm just so excited about the potential for these medicines um, when they're done in the therapeutic setting, so either in a clinic or on a retreat. Um, and not just for people like me who are struggling with existential anxiety and, and worries, but you know, I'm working on studies at the moment with um, anorexia, and we're seeing some really interesting results. So that's with psilocybin therapy and anorexia. Um, we're about to start a study with OCD um, patients, uh, chronic pain as well. And it's not just the mental health um, indications that I'm interested in. You know, more and more we're seeing studies with um, looking at Alzheimer's and psychedelics or cluster headaches and psychedelics. So yes, there's the kind of mental um, indications, but also physical indications. And then beyond that, there's just a whole scope for looking at what psychedelics can do to help with creativity and, you know, all these other kind of um, more kind of well-being um, practices. So I think that's the other thing. It's, it, it, they can really help with quality of life, um, I believe. You know, not only did I lose my fear of dying, but I think my quality of life has been really improved by my experiences. So, yeah, the scope for these medicines, um, when used in the right way, um, with reverence and respect, is, is huge. So it's really exciting time. And, yeah, I think just kind of talks like this are really important to change, the, change view, people's views because they've been stigmatised for so long. Thank you, Lauren. That was incredible. <laughs> By the way, I want to point out, this is the first time any of them have participated in a festival. So this is also an unusual situation, and I've really, you know, that was really affecting and um, wonderful to hear. So, Keith, um, now on to you, but I want, wanted to make sure also that you're going to touch on the three phases of therapy, preparation and the therapy and then the, the, the um, counseling that comes after. And also, also take a moment, also you explained it really well to me about the rewiring of the brain and how the connections are completely reconfigured. So please, but, but with that in mind, please tell us your story. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for having us today. I am, I'm a combat veteran. Uh, I'm a former member of the 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment, which is stationed just down the road in Colchester. Uh, I spent nine years in the Parachute Regiment. And inside those nine years, I served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And Iraq wasn't such a big deal by the time that I'd got there. However, Afghanistan was the type of experience that you would see in the movies, and perhaps more so. It was peak, peak Afghanistan in the summer of 2008. It was incredibly violent incredibly traumatic. It was very exciting, um, but 
very, very difficult. And I, with my experiences in Afghanistan fighting in those fields, which by the way, today is the 14th anniversary of when I lost my two first mm -hmm. friends. Um, it could well have even been around about this time if you take into the time zone. So it's 14 years today, which I no longer believe in coincidences. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we turned up in Afghanistan knowing exactly what we were going to get. We were a combat unit. We all signed up for it. Um, my son's a member of it now today as well. He followed in my footsteps, so to speak. Um, but regardless of your, your feelings about or your intentions for your career in a unit like the parachute regiment, a combat unit, really, and, and the high, high level of training that you get in units like that, really, when you experience firsthand the traumatic death of many, many friends, um, you de there's no training. There's no training that, that helps you with any of that. For my nine years, 16 of my friends died. Not, not all from combat, admittedly, but um, a great deal of that, of those people died in combat. Several of them I was personally involved in, in, that, in that experience as well. And it's deeply traumatic. We got, at the point in time when you're experiencing it, you recognize it as very, very difficult and someone has just died in a terrible way in front of you. But the professionalism comes through and you just think, well, first of all, we need to get out of this situation or we need to remedy this situation, be it fighting harder or just withdrawing. But after, there's no real way, or there wasn't any real way of managing that or dealing with it. And so you feel very underprepared, and you're, but you're a person that is highly prepared. You're a very professional, highly prepared individual that has now been shaken to his core and ripped apart by these traumatic incidences. And so that was essentially me post-Afghanistan in the later months of 2008. And I kind of denied that I was suffering, really. I went through a period of denial where I just thought the best thing that I can do is get myself home, take my son on holiday, go and spend time with my partner, and enjoy life because coming close to death, the one thing it did is teach me how to live and not waste any time just messing around. Uh, so that was helpful to a degree. That was really helpful. But before too long, there was there were signs where I even I recognised through the denial, I recognised that something wasn't right. And one point, I was in a bar in Portland, Oregon, with my partner. She, she lived in. Portland. And we were in a very nice bar. I was with the woman that I loved. I was having a really nice time. I'd survived Afghanistan. I was consciously, I was happy. At this level, I, I was happy. I was content. I was alive. I was with her. We were in a really nice bar having a nice time. And I was talking to her, and she was sat here. And despite happy, a perception of happiness, I was crying. I just started crying. But I wasn't sobbing and heartbroken. So I was just coldly crying. And then the look in her eye told me that something was wrong. And then I realized, hmm, mm, maybe this isn't how you would, ex this isn't a typical experience of someone that's OK. And so that was a kind of trigger point for me that maybe you should go and try and find some help. So I came back home. I thought, I'll go to the doctor, I'll go to the GP. Much, much like we all do in the military, it's not really any different. You still have a GP that you go to, and, and they um, will forward you on to, to a specialist. I went to the GP, and much like everyone uh, that has mental health issues who visit their GP, they said, you've got two options, really. You can have, well, you can do both. You can have talking therapies, and I suggest you start a course of SSRIs, antidepressants. And I thought, well, I mean, yeah, if, that, if that's all there is, then I'll do that, I'll do that. Talking therapies, I went through three rounds with three different therapists. That, for me, is potluck with a psychotherapist. It, it's very important, the relationship is important, not just the skill of the therapist. They can be highly skilled, but you might not have a relationship with that person, and I didn't with three of them. Antidepressants, 
made me numb to everything. And I'm not that sort of person that likes to live that way. I was cold. You might think, as a paratrooper, it might be best to be cold, but I, I'm quite an emotional human being, even back then. And I was very cold and emotionless, and that was not a very nice way to be living. So I, I stopped taking SSRIs, and I went through three rounds of, anti, of talking therapies, and it didn't work. So before long, um, I started experiencing more and more symptoms of my mental health crisis. I started sweating from head to toe at all times, 24 hours a day. That was in my bed at night on my own. That was in a group of people among loved ones. Didn't matter. I was sweating from head to toe, streaming off my fingertips. My bed was soaking every night. Um, I, I woke up every morning and there was hair, big clumps of hair on the pillow. And I kept going to the GP and saying, this isn't working, I need some help. And they're like, well, have you tried yoga? <laughs> so I hadn't tried yoga, so I tried yoga and it didn't, it didn't work. It was, it was like, it was nice, but it didn't, it doesn't heal. Um, and a few years rolled on and I decided, you know what, I have to leave, I have to leave the military. I've done everything that I wanted to do. It's been an incredible career, but I need to leave. And so I am very fortunate enough to walk out of the military on a Friday. And then the next, next Monday, I walked into a job at JP Morgan in the city thinking, what a nice way to get out of the military and just relax <laughs> into civilian life. Right? So I was incredibly naive. Um, so there I am. I buy my big power suit with my huge salary. And I walk into JP Morgan. And that is a beast that does not operate in a particularly healthy way, right? It's chaos. And, and the best bit about it was is that my job was crisis management consultant. <laughs> so it's because gem, like from the perception of the management of JP Morgan, they were saying, who's the calmest guy that we know? And you know, <laughs> by then, I'd experienced a whole host of difficult situations, not just combat. But I do retain an element of calmness, I suppose. And they thought, yeah, we'll just throw some money at him and he can deal with JP Morgan, EMEA, like, um, Europe, Middle East and uh, all of the crises that happen around JP Morgan, Keith can sort that out. <laughs> and I thought, I can sort that out. And, and then it was just, just <laughs> terrible. It was just ter we, had, we had the Greek riots, Egypt fell into a black hole, um, all of these crazy things around our, my particular region fell apart in the first year and a half and and the management wasn't so great at JP Morgan <laughs> it, the man management it wasn't so it wasn't used to the high quality that I was kind of used to um, so I found it very stressful I found it very stressful and I was I was still sweating at this point so I was trying to remain calm I kind of was calm but my body this was the point my body was saying you are not calm you are traumatized um, and I was hanging on. I was hanging on. And one morning I got in and I started, I, I only lived very close to Canary Wharf, so I got in really early one morning. And a, um, someone had jumped off the roof and had landed on, the, on a lower roof of the offices. And I just thought, <sighs> I didn't sign up for JP Morgan to be dealing with another, dragging another dead body off. I didn't actually deal, physically deal with that body, but I thought it was my responsibility, because right? I, was, I was the guy. But this guy, for, for reasons that I don't understand, he, he felt inclined to, to kill himself that day, and, and I just thought, I've had enough of this. And I still didn't have any answers. Right? I still, I still, the only answers I had were SSRIs and talking therapies. And I started doing this. Everything started falling apart. Um, and it, mentally, inside everything started falling apart. I still had a, a support network around me and I still had my home and stuff. But mentally, I was in a very difficult place at this point and knew that I needed change. But I didn't know where that change was coming from. So I felt hopeless, by its very nature, hopeless. And so two of my friends, they both live in LA and they had both separately at this point gone to retreats in Mexico and in Peru. 
and they had come home, these are independent experiences, both come home and both messaged me within weeks and said, both of them said, I've just gone to this retreat and it had this medicine and... Were they veterans? No, no, these okay. were... Um, okay. No, they work in the arts industry in LA, both um, women. Um, and they both said, Keith, if there's anyone in this world that needs to be taking that medicine, <laughs> you need to take this medicine. And, and I trust them implicitly, so... And I don't recommend doing this, but I did no research and I did no preparation. <laughs> I told JP Morgan that I was going on holiday and that I'd see them in two weeks. And so I got on a flight and I flew to Peru. And I found myself in an airport called Tarapoto, which is a jungle town. And then I got met by some very kind people that were, were helping me for, for nothing. Met me at the airport, drove me to a taxi. The taxi drove me to... A, um, a deep, deep jungle town called Jazuta, and they said, you need to get on this boat. And so I got on the boat, and, and the boat took me an hour up the river. So this is a two-hour journey already just from the airport. Took me up river for an hour. I got off the boat, and I had to hike with all of my drinking water, all of my food, all of my equipment, because there were no shops. There's no shops. <laughs> and I hiked to this place, there's a tiny little wooden hut in the middle, of the, the middle of the jungle. And there's no electricity, no running water. There was just a river nearby, banana trees, apple tree, particular type of apple trees. And that was me, they said. Find you, make yourself comfortable, there's a hammock. Um, we'll be back in like eight days. And I thought, okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So I just kind of just hung around and swam in the river and ate bananas. And, <laughs> and then the next thing I know, there's a guy comes walking out through the jungle. This is a couple of days in. Um, a guy comes walking through the jungle, just in jeans and boots, and he, and he has this really dirty bottle of Coca-Cola. Like he's just dipped it in mud, that's what it looks like. And I thought, oh, this must be the guy for my... This must be the shaman. And he turned up and... I don't really speak much Spanish at this point. He speaks no English. And he just says, ayahuasca? And I knew that I was there to be taking ayahuasca. And I said, oh, see, sí, see, sí, see. Sí. <laughs> so he said, por favor. And so I laid down. And he laid down next to me. And he poured this drink into a dirty glass, shot glass that was just, he dipped that in mud as well, as far as I can see. <laughs> I'm not precious about it, but it was disgusting. <laughs> and I've drunk far worse, to be fair. And I drank it, and it's disgusting. Um, he drank it, and he laid down. And then he just said, just, just relax, tranquilo, just listen. And so I lay down, and he starts to sing what are known as Icaros, and they're ceremonial songs to engage with the spirit of the medicine because from his perspective, which is now my perspective, um, he believes that it's a medicine of the spirit. And so he has to sing to the spirit of the medicine to, to bring the spirit out in me now that I've consumed it. So he's singing to the spirit of this medicine to wake it up inside me. And I'm thinking, wow, I mean, it's, it's quite something to hear these people sing. And... I did that twice uh, over those 10 or 8 days and up until very recently outside of Afghan they're the most profound experiences of my life much like Lauren said and just to go I'll, I'll talk about it briefly one of the experiences just to give you some sort of context about what what happened um, I I came to not in this body not in this world in a different reality, out in the middle of the dark and vastness of space. And I was watching the planets, and I was watching time, the nature of time. And, and I was thinking, this is amazing. It's amazing. It's so beautiful. But then, I was like, well, there's not much healing in this, actually. It's just amazing to see planets and time, learn about the essence of time. I was like, wow, I'm going to be pretty wise after this. <laughs> and then... Um, but... I don't know what the healing value of that is. It was just incredible. And then this voice said, have you stopped playing around yet? Are you ready to work? 
this voice out of the darkness, and I thought, that's God. <laughs> <laughs> that's God. I was like, do what God says. Yes, I'm stop playing around. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to work. And then I woke up in a different, I came to in a different place. No, not in this body, not in this realm, not in that realm, in a different realm. And I was in a wooden seat in a very old Victorian or Georgian, the, the very strict wooden classrooms, you know, with a chalkboard, ve those horrible chairs that are leaning <laughs> forwards more than anything, with the, with the thing there as well, the desk there. And in front of the board, I was the only person in the classroom, in front of the board was an, an, an elderly lady that I couldn't see her face, but I recognised that it was, it was an elderly lady and intuitively understood that that was the spirit of the medicine. And she said, you're ready to work? Yes. Um, I, what I'm going to do today is show you how you've behaved. OK. Through your life, I'm going to show you real-world incidences of how you've behaved. And, and I witnessed all of these terrible moments in my personal history. It's very difficult to watch because I was a dickhead, basically. <laughs> and I was thinking, oh, I've behaved pretty poorly. And the acknowledgement of the, the trauma was my responsibility. I was responsible for my trauma because it's my behaviour. I'm responsible, which was hard. That's a humbling moment when you realise that you're responsible for your trauma. Um, and she said, would you like to be able to behave in a different way? I said, yes, please. So then she, in this image, in this mental image, she took on my body in all of those experiences and behaved how she would behave given that interaction, that stimuli. And I observed that. And she said, does that look like a healthier way of behaving than what you did? I said, yes. She said, right, now the task is that you need to recreate as close as you can my behaviour in your experiences. So I went back through all of my life experiences and tried to react the same way that she did, which was from a place of compassion, forgiveness, gratitude, and a place of service. And these are the lessons that I took, that compassion, forgiveness, gratitude, and service are the pillars of our, of our, well, of our reality, really. But... Um, Anyway, so if I, if I succeeded, she said, well done, on to the next one. And if I failed, I went back and had to do it again. And this was lifetime. So I did all of my past life, and then I did all of potential experiences that were yet to unfold, um, and just hypothetical situations, but over lifetimes, spanning lifetimes. And so that's a pretty profound experience. So I left the jungle, just conscious of time, so I'm running through I left the jungle and I thought, uh, I have been healed of my trauma. I have been healed of my trauma. Uh, I can't be the only one. I can't be the only veteran that gets access to this medicine. And so somewhere in the back of my mind, I made a contract and I said, I'll sort myself out because I've still got work to do. I'll sort myself out and then I am going to create some way of where I'm going to help other veterans, other people, gain access to this medicine because no one I knew had done it. Only these two women. That's, that was it. Um, and so it took me about five or six years to integrate. I'll talk about integration later because I had no coaching. I had no preparation. I just went into the jungle with this shaman, had those experiences, and then I came out and I was back at J.P. Morgan, and which was difficult, so I quit and I started my own businesses. Fast forward, I have sorted myself out, and about in, in the early winter of 2020, I thought, I'm ready. Easter 2020, I'm going to take seven veterans to the jungle and give them access to this medicine. Right? So I'm going to take them to this same shaman. And... But then we all got locked down, so nothing happened. And at the same time as this, I, was, I recognised the importance for a structured organisation to do this responsibly. And so with the help of, of, of a, a friend of mine, an American, who founded Heroic Hearts Project in the US, he very kindly said, why don't you just start the UK branch of Heroic Hearts? So Heroic Hearts UK was created and... That's 
the organisational structure, that's the responsible structure that um, introduces veterans to these medicines. But unfortunately, one lockdown happened, and I said, don't worry, after this lockdown, next Easter in 2021, then we'll go to Peru and we'll get, every, we'll, we'll get you access to this medicine, and then we got locked down again. And then I said, after that, don't worry, in 2022, Easter, we're going to go to Peru. And then we didn't get a lockdown. And so in Easter of this year, I took four veterans to the jungle and we had an amazing time. I say we because I shared in that because I was there with them. Um, so just to answer the point that Joanna was making earlier about preparation, the three phases, we start with preparation, we have the ceremonial experiences and then we integrate afterwards, okay? We, we have team members that help people prepare, make dietary changes to their life and psychological and spiritual practices that help someone prepare and begin the healing journey in itself, taking responsibility for that healing journey. That could involve just not eating meat or not having sex and uh, a reduction in caffeine, recreational drugs. That all needs to go out the window. But also doing things like journaling and maybe a body-based practice to just just take some responsibility for your healing before the ceremonies. Then, so then we went, to, we went to Peru, had the experiences, and, and everyone had, it's been a 100% success rate. Um, there were two, two people that were, afterwards I learned that they said they would have killed themselves if they hadn't have gotten that retreat. And uh, the other two were in very, very dark places, most without going into their personal details. Really, it, focused around a lot of shame and guilt because most of us have killed people and a lot of us weren't able to save people that have died, our own friends. So, and I, that was my experience as well. So all of this weight of this guilt and this shame, you know, and they're, and they're not Catholics, so guilt isn't their game. They, they, it's really difficult for them to, to, to live their lives in any sort of meaningful way because they've killed people and their friends have died and they weren't able to help. Nothing else helped them. They were hopeless. And then the ayahuasca got in them and started doing its work. And they are now in a very, 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 very positive place. We're helping them integrate their experiences with, with, my, with the staff. And it's a 100% success rate. It's still early days from a clinical perspective, I suppose, because it's only been, well, since Easter, however long that is. But after the ceremonies, they were adamant that the very reason why they were there had been specifically addressed through the medicine. And then after, when we've given them more time through the integration process, they recognise now that they're making changes in their career paths, which, which both Joe and Lauren have done. Uh, they're eating healthier and they're playing with their children, um, which is an important point that we normally always forget. It's not always about us. Our wives and our husbands and our children get us back. Yeah, so, so they get healed as well because they've got this cold, cold monster in the house of like the, my, my own perspective of uncaring, uh, an inability to love fully. So the children know this, you know, and then they grow up to be adults of a father that's not able to love them properly. And that changes like this. They get home and they're full of love for their kids, full of love for their partners. So it's not just about us. It's more than us. Um, it's the beauty of this medicine. And what I would like to end on, have I still got time? One yeah. final point, the most beautiful thing happened to me on Thursday of this week, just gone, is my phone rang from an un unknown number. I, I was like, I don't know who this is. Um, but a text came through from the HR manager of a huge international uh, haulage company. Very, you would all know it. Huge company. And th they wanted to talk. They wanted to speak. So I, I phoned them and she said, um, Keith, you run Heroic Hearts? Yes. Hello, how can I help you? Um, I have an employee named and I just wanted to say, whatever you did, thank you very much. <laughs> because this guy was in wow. a very bad way. He was in a bad way. And she knew it and all of their team knew it, that he was he was spiralling way out of control and he was one of the guys that was suicidal. And now, quote, he is a beacon of light. And I was just, 
uh, nearly in tears because <laughs> it was so beautiful. And now this company are talking to us, Heroic Hearts as an organisation, and that they might now be ready to discuss privately funding a retreat only for the veterans within their organisation to gain access to this medicine, which is profoundly enlightened thinking from an organisation of such size and a beautiful thing to do. And that a human being took the time to say thank you to, it's, it's not just me, it's our team, but to acknowledge that this medicine does what it does is the most beautiful thing. Um, so I've talked way too long. <laughs> no, 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 we didn't want to. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> okay. I want to I just ask you about Heroic Hearts and then I'm going to open the floor. I mean, I have a ton of questions. I didn't even mention the Heroic Hearts. So. No, that was a beautiful <laughs> way to conclude your portion of the discussion. But So, okay, the only place that you can conduct this therapy is outside the country. So you have to take veterans to Peru. I just want to, is that right? It doesn't have to be Peru, but yes. For everything that Joe mentioned earlier about rescheduling and the classes of these right. of these compounds and medicines, it has to be. It can't be in this country. Okay, and then for the two of you, um, I wanted to ask one other question. You said it really, it's obviously improved the quality of your life. It's enabled you to lead flourishing, healthy, loving lives. What about for an ordinary person who's not got any deep mental mm -hmm. trauma? Comment on that. It would. I can speak to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, as as a kind of as a psychiatrist and a, a doctor, I obviously am working on the trials at Imperial with with various different mental illnesses, and I also facilitate at retreats in the Netherlands. And um, so these are legal psilocybin retreats, and those retreats we we screen um, we basically screen out anyone with any mental illness. The screening's quite a tough process. Um, so we take well people, um, kind of healthy normals. It's a really horrible term, but so we take people without any <laughs> kind of uh, so-called mental illness. And obviously, you know, mental health is a spectrum. So, of course, uh, it shouldn't be, you know, that black and white. Um, but we, we just, I came back from a retreat three weeks ago and um, we took 16 members of the general public and everyone had a... Uh, just such a beautiful, profound healing experience. Even those, there were definitely a few people who had challenging experiences, and I think that's something we really need to highlight, that um, these, these experiences aren't always easy, and actually um, the healing comes when people are, are willing to kind of go towards the pain, their past traumas, the, the heartbreak that they've kind of endured, and when they come out the other side, it was so beautiful saying goodbye to them at Amsterdam um, station, just these glowing, beautiful faces. Um, it really looked like a weight had been lifted off so many people. And, you know, people reported um, just... We, we're on a WhatsApp group, because obviously the integration part is really, really important, and we've had cool, um, Zoom calls with them since, and we've got another Zoom call with them next week. And our WhatsApp group is, is so beautiful, because people are sharing pictures of them out in nature, they're sharing songs, they're sharing that they're all dancing, they're moving, they're in, enjoying more um, love with their friends and family. And so I think, although the focus at the moment is very much on the clinical, um, and it needs to be in, in order to kind of hopefully change the scheduling and really get this, this movement going legally in the UK, it's also incredible seeing what can happen in these retreat settings for healthy normals. <laughs> Keith, I, just quickly also, I remember during one of our prep calls that one reason that veterans also found this so appealing is because how many times do you have to do this treatment? I mean, compared to yeah. permanently taking antidepressants, I think that's a really crucial point also to yeah. share with the audience. So my first, just if you take my example, I took two doses in 2014, that first time that I told you about, and I took another two doses this Easter uh, in between that time. I haven't felt the need for ayahuasca at all. The guys on the retreat, they had three doses, and I'll be amazed if it's not several, several years before they feel any real need to go anywhere near this medicine again. Joe, would you say that it causes a permanent rewiring of the brain? Is that, would that be a reasonable way to describe <laughs> the it's, result? Yeah, I mean, it certainly causes um, 
so your brain is you know, subdivided into circuits, and it certainly enables circuits in the brain to communicate with each other that are kind of prevented from doing that. And it, it inhibits that. I was talking to somebody last night, and David Nutt says it's like the orchestra playing without the conductor. So your brain is kind of allowed to, to the communication that it's prohibited from. Um, and what you get is neuroplasticity because of, of the pharmacology of these uh, substances. So that means that some of the changes that you get when you're taking the, these drugs persist. Okay. And, and so that gives you this lasting right. benefit. Okay. That's uh, why it can be one, one time even. Absolutely. That's very and like Keith was saying, and you know, what changes this for all of us is hearing these stories. You know, we could stand up and talk about what they do in the brain, you know, and, and what about the clinical trials. But it's really once you have spoken to somebody who's had this experience, you know, that's what changed it for me. I was working in drug discovery all my career looking for better treatments for mental illness. I worked on some, I'm a very early stage animal researcher. You know, we, I worked on some brilliant projects with big pharma, small pharma, that's what I've always done. Um, in 40 years, we've come nowhere. You know, I haven't actually got a medicine or been part of a project that's got a medicine onto the market that's made a big difference for patients. There are Me Too drugs, there are lots of, of small innovations, but nothing, nothing that you know, comes close to this. So it, and as Lauren was saying, there are other extraordinary medicinal properties of these, <coughs> these substances. They're anti-inflammatory, and lots of illnesses are caused by inflammation. And that animal work, uh, sorry, that work is in animals so far, but there's, there's evidence that, that the, there will be anti-inflammatory effects in okay. people. So no, it's extraordinary. I, no. I'm sure that the audience has uh, quite a few questions, so we're going to try to take as many as we can. Okay, Mike. Oh, oh Nathan. Okay. Because uh, you didn't get your question yesterday. Okay. The one and done nature of the treatment, does that mean that the big pharma might be either uh, indifferent or hostile to the adoption of these therapies? It's a really, really good question. And big pharma is not hostile to this at all. They clearly see that this is going to be big money. Because, you know, the paradigm won't always be the same. For pain, you probably will need to take these medicines more. So and they'll that, charge 10,000 pounds? I, you know... You know, it's, it's very complicated, and as I said, there are 50 companies uh, listed on the stock exchange that are developing psychedelics, and they're developing second-generation psychedelics and third-generation psychedelics, and some that won't have quite the same, you know, profound effects. Um, so this, at the moment, it, it, it is huge business. And the, the industry was worth two billion in 2020, and it's set to rise to you know 11 billion. It's absolutely extraordinary. And daily, there's another company comes along developing Silas, and they're kind of there are lots. I, so when I last looked, there were 65 clinical trials on psilocybin alone, and there are many other psychedelics out there. So at the moment, but this cannot last. You know, and having IP intellectual property on a plant medicine, and these, so there is a lot, a lot of complexities, and you know, we're trying to work on the ethics of this, and, and you were talking about a company that's, that's very involved with this. Okay, Mike, so. oh, Mike, go ahead. Um, I'll try. <coughs> so, you both mentioned, uh, you both mentioned music in one form or another, um, and so, as a, I, technically speaking, how long, was your session, and was the music playing throughout that session, and what kind of music, and was it as good as you think it was, or were you, <laughs> was it the cart leading the horse, or was the horse leading the cart, could it have been anything, or was it scientifically, um, you know, um, mm -hmm. cultivated, as yeah. it were? So, yes, the music was playing the entire time, so for about six I mean, you lose, you lose time, but it was about six, six hours or so. And the playlist that they used at the retreat that I went on in the Netherlands was the same one used for the Silodep trial at Imperial. And that was created by a neuroscientist called Mendel Kalen. Is that, isn't that the right name? I've got that, Mendel? So. Yeah. Um, who's now gone on to set up a company called Wavepaths, and they're actually creating music for psychedelic therapists to oh, wow. use 
when it's finally rolled out. Was it, was it sort of organic or was it computer based? It was, um, so it was really varied um, musical journey. Um, everything from um, classical music to indigenous music. It was a really mixed bag, but it's created in a kind of arc right. um, to take you on the journey. So it really does ramp up um, as the medicine's kicking in. And, and, you know, it, and as I said, it, in a way, not that it manipulates your emotions, but there is a sense that you're being guided. Mm -hmm. And actually, some of the tracks, you're pre-warned that you'll probably hate some of the music because there's so much in there. Of course, you can't cater to everyone's taste, but there's actually a reason for that that a neuroscientist would be able to explain much better than me. But it's a sense that you, when you're in those difficult places and you're trying to push something away and you're really not liking it, if you can turn towards it and just surrender into it, that's when big shifts and big kind of openings happen. So okay. the, the lady in amazing. the back, Jacqueline, I think. That's Jacqueline. Susanna, right there. Right there. Yeah. Hi, thank you for such an incredible talk. And uh, thank you for your service very much. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, even though I'm not British, I really appreciate that. Um, so I think it's a really important point about the classification of the drugs that you brought up early on because you know, the way that we handle that from, like, say, a criminal perspective versus a research perspective is really hampering research in many areas. You know, cannabis is another one, like, yeah. you know, et cetera. So I think this is, this is problematic for science, uh, especially because the sort of upstream, you know, physiological impacts that these substances have on the body and, and being able to change things in such a radical way for such a long-lasting period of time. Um, it's so important for us to understand. Some uh, people say with methamphetamine, you, they can have in a single use of that, you know, the opposite. It can cause terrible changes to uh, biochemistry just from, a, you know, and people become highly addicted, and so they have a negative impact. And so I just wanted to say that there's a lot of support. I work in the sci medical science. There's a lot of support for the changing of these regulations. And I think people need to uh, get involved with their government representatives to support that as yeah. much as they can. If you have any information how people can do that here in the UK, maybe you could share that with us. Oh, right. write to your MP. That is the best way to do it. Go and see your MP, write to your MP, and ask them to bring this up and for us in the House of Commons. I mean, in the States, they have changed the law in, in Oregon and many cities. You know, they've decriminalized psychedelics. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. But they haven't done anything like that here. And uh, what I really want to see is compassionate access. So you've heard, you know, the enormous healing benefit. So for people with the existential anxiety with the, the diagnosis, um, combat veterans, and Canada are doing that through a company called Theracil. It's on a case-by-case -case basis, but they've enabled 55 people to have it, you know, on a... On a um, yeah, for compassionate access. We could do that here. The UK government could do that. Okay, one more question. We'll take it from that side of the room. Okay. No, no, no. Behind. John Paul, go ahead. <laughs> no, not my, not my stepdaughter. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for... She for could your, ask you guys later. Thank you for your um, talk today. I really appreciate that. Uh, so we've been focusing mostly on psilocybin and ayahuasca. I was wondering how many other common psychedelics there are and how do you choose what's right for you or how do you find out what's right for you? Can, can I just question. also comment before, you, I know this is about psychedelics but if we come from the, sort of the perspective of the uh, looking for medicines in the Amazonian basin regardless of whether that's Peru or Colombia, um, nearly everything in that jungle is a medicine and you can take those medicines for very specific... Uh, I've done this as well. It's not just about psychedelics, which... So that I, I feel like I'm trying to answer your point with the idea that you might not have to actually always do psychedelics. There are specific plant medicines that treat very specific things, and these have been used for a long, long time. Um, and I've just had experience of that myself, taking a non-psychedelic medicine for a very particular reason, and it, it worked just shockingly, shockingly well. Um, so there are just there are other options. It doesn't have to be psychedelics, even though they are incredibly powerful medicines. I, 
I just wanted to make that. Okay. Yeah, I, that, I think, that's he, a good I think point. he wanted a practical answer. So, Lauren, do you want to answer that, or do you, Joe? Um. I mean, I think the reason that psilocybin has become used in clinical trials is because it's shorter acting than LSD. LSD is a much longer half-life. So you can't let somebody go after a day. You know, you'd have to have the, I think it's a practical, but it, it also doesn't seem to be quite as kind of hardcore an experience as LSD. But, you know, psilocybin was not isolated in the lab until 1960. And as I said, LSD, 1938. So if you look at the early papers, they're all around LSD. And they are very similar in their mechanism of action. And of course, there are a number of other, you know, substances that people use. Oh, well, that, yeah, yeah. There is a company developing 5-MeO-DMT, the, the frog. Um, yeah, so, and, and for some people, that is the psychedelic that works, and DMT itself doesn't, you know, the active ingredient of ayahuasca. So, yeah, absolutely. And as, as Keith said, there are many of substances, you know. Uh, how do you figure out what's right for you, like you, you chose from so, your first recommendation, I presume. Yeah. I think it's important mm. to be patient-led in this, this, yeah. instead of doing it the other way around, which... Uh, I, I just, yeah. By the way, okay, because we must end this session. Um, <laughs> the Drug Science website is an incredible uh, repository of information, literally on a very large number of drugs, uh, and obviously psychedelics. Mm but also even alcohol, cannabis, a lot of other drugs. And it's, a, it's a, one of the, it's I free. would say, one of the world's top websites. And their podcast series is incredible. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, but thank you, Can everyone, I just finish for... on one thing? Can yes, I take yes, one yes. minute? Heroic Hearts is a charity. We need a load of funding to get these veterans <laughs> yeah. out. Yeah. Um, so I've got, uh, it's heroicheartsuk.com. Just be aware that it's heroicheartsuk.com, not the American okay. version. And can um, I do a shout-out as well to... Um, <laughs> Essence. <laughs> Final Essence one. Medicine. Um, so I run a non-profit called Essence Medicine, and uh, myself and a palliative care nurse have set this organisation up. And at the moment, we're running online programmes and in-person retreats in the UK for those facing life-threatening illness. But the plan is to become similar to Heroic Hearts and ideally take cancer patients um, to the Netherlands for these experiences and hopefully at some point be able to run them in the UK because obviously it's really hard for people who are unwell to travel and things. So yeah, keep an eye out for us as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.